Yeah, so I'll just start off with briefly an introduction about Signe, just to set the context, you know, there is no uh, uh, marketing spiel here. Um, so we are, uh, you know, a technology, you know, incubated from IIT Madras, uh, several startups uh, are there from different IITs, focused singularly on energy storage, uh, both for electric vehicles as well as for uh, energy storage, you know, telecom and other applications. Um, and, uh, and then we believe that, uh, you know, energy storage is going to be the future of electric grid, the future of electric mobility. Uh, so that's the, and we have been sort of our journey uh, started uh, about eight years back. As part of any startup, you know, you end up, uh, you know, building products. So we have done about uh, 50,000 of uh, distributed renewable energy installations all over India. We have also done about 125 megawatt hour of energy storage. Um, and then, uh, you know, we have powered about 125,000 electric vehicle. Uh, I saw the last speaker talking about, uh, you know, a lot of issues. So we'll spend some time on that. But uh, essentially, the journey has been, uh, you know, as they say, you know, the, you know, very rewarding. We had also sort of won, uh, you know, a microgrid uh, conference award for our microgrid uh, works that we have done in Northeast. Thank you, Rajiv. So let me start off with, uh, uh, into the topic now. Uh, the EV and the battery uh, have a very strong correlation, right? So if you were to see, uh, you know, a decade back, the cost of EV batteries were uh, closer to about, uh, you know, $1,000 per kilowatt hour, right? Uh, you know, 10x of the cost to what it is there. Uh, and as the cost sort of came down, uh, you know, the EV adoption increases, you know, fairly straightforward coordination. Uh, and predominantly what happens is as, uh, you know, the, the EV adoption increases, the cost were coming down. There is something called as a rights law, which basically talks about for every doubling of the capacity, your, uh, you know, cost of the lithium ion battery comes down by a certain percentage. In this case, about 18%, which has been sort of proven uh, for the last 15 years or so. Uh, the challenge we have is on the, uh, you know, the critical minerals, right? So we all know today uh, that, uh, you know, most of these minerals uh, are all sort of confined to, uh, you know, few countries only, right? That is the first point. And second one, uh, you know, uh, each one of these minerals are sort of, uh, uh, you know, for example, lithium, uh, you know, available more in Australia and Latin America, uh, you know, cobalt more in the DRC in Africa and so on. But there are only handful of countries which are, which are holding this, uh, you know, mine production. Uh, what happens is there is a zero uh, sum game, right? Today, you need, as the electric adoption increases for EVs, you need more of these critical minerals. But at the same time, almost all the countries are vying for the same set of resources. Uh, what it essentially means is that, uh, you know, you, of course, have issues because, uh, you know, there is a geopolitical uh, things that comes into effect. And number two was uh, sustainability also becomes very important. Of course, my next speaker will talk about, uh, you know, recycling and what do we need to do because that's going to be very critical because we don't find India's name in any of this, right? Whether it is lithium, whether it is cobalt, whether it is graphite, uh, you know, any one of these critical minerals which are needed for, uh, uh, for batteries especially, right? Uh, the second part of it, this is also a very interesting slide, maybe we'll spend a uh, you know, few minutes to talk about it. See, on the x-axis it is talking about for all the clean products which are going to come out, right? Whether it is, uh, you know, energy storage, whether it is solar, whether it is wind. Uh, weighted coverage concentration meaning how much of this, you know, products will use these critical minerals, right? How many of them? The y-axis is talking about what would be the production increase over the next, uh, you know, 20, 30 years, right, till 2050. Uh, and if you see the quadrant one, right, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're able to see that here, um, you have a bunch of critical minerals which are only used in few, uh, you know, uh, clean energy product. Uh, and their requirement is also not very high. So which means that the quadrant one, in a way, we are fairly in a good shape. If you were to look at, for example, neodymium, right, uh, it's predominantly for you know, motors predominantly for wind energy uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, similarly, indium in solar panels and all. The quadrant two is where, uh, you know, it is used in one or two products. In this particular case, it's predominantly energy storage. But the production capacity requirement to meet the demand is the highest there, right? In this case, predominantly it is lithium and cobalt, both of them being used in energy storage. 
the quadrant three where it is used in many of the clean energy product and where the requirement is also the highest right so in this case it is aluminium right so aluminium pretty much all the products that we have including you know aluminium air and other forms of energy storage as well as in other clean energy product the the quadrant four is where it is used in a lot of products any clean energy product you would need you know the copper the manganese the you know the molybdenum and so on and so forth but the requirement is not very high right so we can still manage so the two messages is one how do we you know as a country india look at the critical minerals which are available and then focus on the technology which matches to that number two how do we globally handle this issue because you need you know lot of lithium lot of cobalt but it's available in certain countries how do we handle right so this is one of this aspect the second many of us already know this but today if you were to look at lithium predominantly i think it is uh, you know produced either in australia or in latin america right almost all the production that happens travels uh, you know all the way from uh, you know from australia or latin america to china right most of the processing happens there uh, and then from there you also have most of the for example if i were to take a case of tesla all of these minerals go travel you know half the world to go to for example you know fremont or somewhere where it is basically converted into uh, battery packs uh, and then from there it sort of comes uh, you know uh, for their nevada factory where the vehicles are assembled and they are all exported back to asian countries in this particular case uh, you know china right so if you were to look at it uh, 50000 miles is how you know some of these minerals travel from the time it is origination to the time it finds in the application uh, very unsustainable way of doing it correct it is you know one because lot of processing happens in you know select few countries and number two the minerals itself is available only in select few countries right so we we'll have to figure out a way to uh, overcome this uh, conundrum right um, now let's talk about how the cell technology is talking about uh, you know in terms of changing today i think uh, you know the previous speaker talked about for example today cell chemistry is constantly evolving right so if there is one message the message is that you know today i know a lot of us are talking about an nmc chemistry or an lfp chemistry i'm sure if you were to be here 3 4 5 years down the line we'll be looking at a lot of variants of the same one what's happening one on the on the cathode side uh, which is predominantly now lfp which is the you know the ferrophosphate one and the nmc which is the nickel manganese and cobalt that's basically becoming more nickel rich less of cobalt right for two reasons one of course cobalt is you know mined in unsustainable condition nickel is available globally so you will have a lesser you know the cost reduction as well as increased energy density uh, that is on the cathode front we'll talk about little bit more in the next one or two slides anode front it is basically moving from uh, you know more graphite anode to more uh, you know uh, silicon anode which is more of silicon in an anode high silicon anode and moving towards a pure silicon anode right and it's also moving towards a pure uh, lithium metal anode as well electrolytes are also sort of moving from a semi a liquid electrolyte to a semi solid to a solid state electrolyte predominantly from a safety perspective so the message is there is going to be a continuous change in the chemistry over the next at least 10 15 years if not more right so now the question is you know how we intersect this chemistry 2 3 years down the line when we are all manufacturing you know a lot of manufacturers are setting up the you know lithium ion cell manufacturing uh, so this sort of gives that in more uh, detailed fashion so if you were to look at cathode is moving uh, you know more from uh, you know on a ncm cathode is going to one high nickel Uh, to an excess nickel to a pure uh, 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 you know high nickel to you know it's basically moving towards and then newer chemistries which are coming up uh, anodes is moving towards uh, you know high silicon to a pure silicon anode similarly electrolytes are moving towards uh, you know from a, a liquid to a semi solid to a solid electrolyte right so this the impact is that the battery engineering changes completely for each one of them i think uh, we talked about the thermal management as your energy density increases your how you manage the thermal side of this in changes you know how do you manage your battery management system across this chemistry it changes right this is going to be one of the you know challenge um, and and this sort of gives a slightly more detail in terms of how this is going to work out 
you would see the you know the gray and the dark gray light gray and dark gray that gives you the variance of uh, nmc chemistry right which is basically moving from a low nickel maybe in this case you know 333532 uh, to a high nickel which is 811 and so on uh, similarly the one in the green is the lfp and lfp variant right there are you know traditional lfps which are known to be good for over the next you know, last 20 years we have proven that but there are variants of lfp which is coming which is also a manganese which is added to the lfp and there are newer chemistries which are coming up which is you know lithium sulfur and so on and so forth all of this uh, is what is going to happen so i think you know next uh, several years for those practitioners in this industry it's going to be very interesting to watch how this play uh, you know space is going to play out right the second important point is um, I, what I wanted to sort of say is that one is the chemistry part of it, right? Uh, so battery is chemistry, but battery is also as much a semiconductor and software, okay? Um, yesterday, I think Shiva was talking about people talking about semiconductor hardware and software. The amount of, uh, uh, you know, the software that goes inside and the kind of semiconductor that goes inside a battery pack uh, is mind-boggling, right? Uh, you know, that is one aspect of it, so which is the battery management system. This is sort of a blown up of a, a battery pack. There are about 80 components inside a battery pack, right? Just not the cell alone. Um, so from, uh, you know, from a safety side, uh, you know, you have all the thermal management we talked about. Uh, you have, uh, you know, all the pressure relief walls to make sure that the battery does not get into this unsafe condition. Similarly, uh, you know, from an electrical side, you also add, you know, electrical, you know, fuses which are integrated into the bus bar, you know, all the cell holders and so on. Each one of them uh, is an engineering, you know, um, uh, technology by itself, right? So now what do we need to do? One, uh, there is no uh, standard for a battery pack, you know, in terms of dimensions or capacities or voltage or current and so on and so forth. Each one of them have a different uh, capacity. The important is to make sure that you commonalize the architecture as much as possible, right? So that we don't have to sort of invent each one of these components as you do. And number two, we also need to have a lot of newer forms of uh, batteries are evolving, right? You know, battery as a service, battery swapping, you know, traditional batteries and so on and so forth. And there is a tremendous value for value engineering which is in India. So today, unfortunately, the cells are imported, but all the other components, there are local uh, players which are available. So there is a lot of work which is happening there. Last two slides and then I'll leave it for uh, this thing. So, uh, so what happens is on the, on the hardware and software side, uh, Today, the battery pack is all about a battery management system, which is basically making sure that you monitor uh, and then make sure that the batteries are operated in a safe condition, right? Anytime there is an unsafe condition, it cuts off the battery pack. But that is the beginning of it, right? There is going to be a lot more of the software that are going to get added, which includes the state of functions, it includes the state of safety, where you are going to basically make sure that you are able to predict the life of the battery at the end of one or two years. You are able to offer insurance on the battery, you know, after a couple of years. You can predict whether this, this can have a second life use for the batteries and so on and so forth. Tremendous work which is going and the battery pack itself is going from an individual device uh, to a lot of things happening on the cloud, including a digital twin and making sure that a lot of this uh, you know, dynamic characterization happens depending on where the battery is operated, under which condition. Lot of things is it to happen, right? For especially for you know, uh, for uh, countries like India, because predominantly we are relying on a two-wheeler and three-wheeler kind of transport. Um, the other thing is also there is a tremendous opportunity for a newer uh, form of, for example, AI, right? So this is I've just taken one example. Um, you know, this is a study which is done at Stanford, but now getting implemented at the industry level, where what they have done is they have taken, uh, you know, a bunch of LFP chemistry cells which are available in the market. Uh, they have taken the model of that. Now, the biggest challenge we have is a battery, uh, you know, if you were to saw the, uh, look at the curve, there is a knee, right? You know, it is working well and suddenly the back drops dead, right? Whether it is our cell phone, whether it is our car, it's the same problem. Now the question is, when you are getting this battery, how do I know that the battery is in a good shape? You know, will it come for me for 100 cycles, 1000 cycles or 5000 cycles? How do I predict it? Lot of interesting research is going on. In one such research, what happens is, you can just do a 5 cycles on the cell 
and can predict the life of the battery up to a 95% accuracy actually, right? And this is possible because you have a modeling, you have an AA and then you sort of do, uh, you know, stuff on top of that. How does it, uh, you know, for example, for a battery manufacturer like me, it helps me because today when I wait to get it, I can quickly do a five cycle in less than a day and then tell me saying that I can offer a better warranty, better uh, this thing to my customers and so on. Um, so last slide, I think I'm just on right now. So today for the, you know, for the technology to evolve, one, uh, there is a very critical piece of recycling. And you know, of course, I could not stress on that fact. I'm letting the other speaker going to talk about it. And number two, I think we would also need a PLI scheme, you know, especially today the PLI is on the ACC battery cell chemistry, but it is not on the upstream. We need to do that. And number three, there is a lot of research that are yet to happen on the battery chemistries, which are, uh, you know, for the materials which we have that available abundantly. You know, for example, aluminium could be a great example. I think these are all the ones that I think, uh, you know, industry think tanks, uh, which some of which I am also part of, we have sort of talking to them to get that. I will stop my, uh, my talk and then if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take it.